angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and they are not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test, to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. I'll give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Uh, the elders here have got the privilege of opening up the word to you today. Um, just a big shout out, thanks for wrestling my disobedient kids. That's uh, very helpful. Um, uh, please have that passage open in front of you um, on page uh, 1234. Um, that will really help you. I think there's some sheets going round. What I'd say about those sheets is there's some questions there, kids, uh, for you to answer. Some of them uh, might not be the easiest, most straightforward. So if you're not sure, don't worry. But just maybe speak to the person who brought you to church at the end and, uh, and talk about them. Uh, let me pray before we make a start. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Heavenly Father, we're so often prone to distraction. Uh, we're so often prone to caring more about this world than you. So we want to pray that we would have ears that hear this morning. I pray, Lord, that these would be uh, your words, Lord, that are spoken, not mine. And I pray, Lord, that we'd uh, leave here uh, more confident of your truth and changed. In your name, amen. Um, I think there's going to be some slides as I uh, talk through this. So I don't know if you uh, know this date at all. We've had uh, the 80th year anniversary, haven't we, uh, this year. Uh, the Normandy invasion on the 6th of June 1944, known as D-Day. Many of you will remember Ron, who uh, used to come to this church, who uh, was one of the soldiers on that day. Um, it was an operation, wasn't it, that was kept secret. And the end of it brought uh, the liberation of France and it laid the foundations uh, for an Allied victory on the Western Front and probably the war in general. There were thousands upon thousands of soldiers at Normandy um, and it was divided into kind of five sections uh, of the uh, operation. There were many obstacles in the way, the weather being one of them. And when they actually got to the beaches, there were kind of like wooden stakes, metal tripods, barbed wire, making it difficult for the operation to take place. It was a dangerous operation, and uh, casualties on that day were at least 10,000, with 4,414 soldiers confirmed dead. Uh, why am I telling you this? Well, it's because before the glory of the victory, there was suffering, wasn't there? Uh, intense suffering that many uh, will never come up against and probably me and you will never face. But what they fought for, the sacrifice they made, that victory would last for generations, wouldn't it? And it's one of those pictures of a bigger story, the bigger story of the gospel, which is suffering before glory. It's the cross before the crown. And the victory of Jesus would not just secure victory for uh, generations, it would secure an eternal future for whoever trusts in him. In this letter that John tells the church in Smyrna, uh, living as a Christian is not going to be straightforward. Following Jesus means accepting the cross before receiving the glory. So as we look in, uh, into this passage, 
uh, we need to figure out, don't we, who uh, is writing the passage and who, uh, who it is is being written to. So verse 8 shows this, doesn't it? These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. These are the words of Jesus, the one who was before all creation and the one who will be there in the end, the one who went to the cross and who beat death. Um, Tony's touched on this as he was uh, speaking earlier, wasn't there? This week has been a tragic week and there's been lots of times where um, there's been misinformation and disinformation and people wanting to give their point of view on these tragic events. And it's sometimes hard for us, isn't it, to trust what is really going on. There are numerous voices that compete for our attention. But when it comes to the Bible, there is no debate about trustworthiness. These are the words of Jesus, and they are ultimate reality. This isn't someone with a few Twitter followers or a newspaper with an agenda. These are the words of the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, there are many strategies, isn't there, uh, around now that try and prolong life, whether it's uh, cold plunge, which I know is popular at the moment, uh, or the latest anti-aging cream. I'm about to turn 38, as you people have been reminded of. I don't know, maybe I'll need some of that. Um, or there's the tiny little vitamin tablets that you can take. Um, these are all short-term measures, aren't they? But they can't undo the fact that everyone at some point passes on to the next life. Jesus, however, has the authority to say the things written to us because he's the only person in history to have beat that undefeatable object, which is death. He is the one who truly knows. Uh, I know is a phrase that's mentioned twice in the early part of this passage. Jesus is not only the authority that wrote these words, and they're not in a cold way. He knows the battles that the Christians in Smyrna are going to face. And he knows the battles that his followers face today. He knows the trials of this church and he knows the trials of this church in the future. So um, that's who's writing the letter. Who is he writing it to? Well, he's writing it to the church in Smyrna. And last week we saw, didn't we, uh, the letter to Ephesus, and it had kind of both negatives and positives to share. When our, in our letter today, the letter to Smyrna, you'll notice that it's one of the only letters where there is no negatives mentioned it is a church that is praised for their faith in Christ. Um, now, kids, I don't know if you know where this is. It's a dead obvious question. Should be. Here we go. If it comes up. It's really not worth the suspense, but anyway. Um, where's that? Who knows where that is? Paris, yeah. So um, that's, that's me and Kaylee in Paris. If you've been... Uh, watching the watching the Olympics, it kind of um, reminded me of one of my more romantic moments in our marriage, where I uh, arranged a surprise trip uh, for Kaylee for us to go to Paris after she graduated. Um, it was a little bit uh, bad on the organisation because I booked to not the normal airport of Paris, but an airport that was two hours away from the centre of Paris. <laughs> Didn't start off great, but it did it did improve and. Uh, we had, a, we had a great couple of days there. We, um, that picture um, on the, was on the Saturday when we got there. And we basically walked the whole of Saturday round Paris and we stayed up. If you know me, I like to go to bed at 10 o'clock. But uh, she persuaded me to stay up till 12 o'clock to watch the Eiffel Tower lit up. Okay. It's, it's an amazing city, Paris. Um, and it's a rich city financially. And it's... A, a, a city that is renowned, isn't it, for its culture. Uh, it's got a few of the famous art galleries there. Not that we went to them, we're not really into art, but it's a city that is full of life. And Smyrna was kind of the same. It was a city that had a lot going for it. Um, it had cultural 
and financial capital. Um, I think we've got a picture of where it was. Um, so there you can see it there. Um, it was, it's now uh, the city of Izmir, which is in, in modern-day Turkey. So it was, it was a rich city. It was known as the crown of Asia. And there were many famous uh, kind of poets that came um, out of there. One of them was called Homer. That's not the yellow guy from The Simpsons. He's a, a famous poet. By ancient standards, Smyrna was a very good place to live, a city that had everything going for it. That was, though, except if you were a follower of Jesus. Um, as we read this passage earlier, you might have seen some words that jumped out, of you, jumped out at you. Uh, John writes that these Christians are afflicted and they're in, pos in poverty, and there will be persecution and imprisonment. John goes as far to say that they will be brought even to the point of death. Being a Christian in Smyrna was hard. It wasn't a city break. And uh, perhaps we uh, lose sight maybe here uh, in the West. We've enjoyed uh, years, haven't we, of religious freedom. But across the world, the reality of persecution and imprisonment is very much real. Uh, Open Doors estimates that there's 365 million believers today, that's one in seven, who face a form of persecution and discrimination. The daily reality for Christians in Smyrna, and for many today, is poverty and affliction. And uh, I came across this story um, uh, last month. Uh, this was a story of um, a pastor who wanted to raise... Uh, 70 million from his uh, crowd funded from his kind of uh, followers and his, his church uh, to have a private jet. Uh, why am I telling you this? Well, it just, when I was reading this passage, it reminded me of this story and it's kind of the opposite to what authentic Christianity is. Authentic Christianity is not private jets and material wealth. It's usually poverty and affliction but it sh it, it's poverty and affliction yet it says here that the Christians are the rich ones they didn't look impressive but they had all the riches in Christ as people would have looked out at Smyrna and seen the people with um, material wealth cultural wealth Christians probably wouldn't have got a look in they were not a bunch of impressive people and more than just the physical threat of persecution, you will have noticed that there's a threat to reputation. And in verse 9, there's, a, again, a, a rather confusing part about um, in the passage, um, because Christians in Smyrna are being slandered by some Jewish people. It says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, you might read this and be a little bit alarmed um, and think maybe that's a bit anti-Semitic, um, especially with the height and tensions around at the moment. But we need to put this in context that it's written in. Uh, Paris has a slogan, doesn't it, uh, called the City of Love. Smyrna's slogan uh, in those days was Roman in all things. Smyrna had a city that had an allegiance to Rome and it was Caesar who was meant to be worshipped and adored. But alongside this, the Jewish community had worked hard and fought hard to win religious freedom, and the Roman authorities would let them worship in the synagogue as long as this didn't interfere um, with the, the Roman practices. But this allegiance was always precarious. It could break down at any moment. And so the Jewish people were not happy when Christians rocked up and said there's a Lord and Saviour who is the first and the last. One who is above any empire. And this was causing problems for the Jews who were going to the synagogue because the authorities couldn't tell the difference between the new Christians and the Jews who were attending the synagogue. And some of the Jews responded by slandering the new Christians. Now, we could maybe just write that off as religious 
intolerance, but there is a lot of begrudging acceptance, isn't there, of Jesus. Uh, We like Jesus if he's not front and centre in our lives. Uh, We see people who are okay with Christmas and Easter, but if believing in Jesus means regular church attendance, they're not really interested. Society is okay with the church doing food banks, giving to the poor. We just can't preach on the moral issues of the day. And what about on a personal level? We can think, can't we? Well, I give to the church. Um, I give up my time for Speak Kids, for Welcome Club. Um, but Jesus, I don't know if you can speak into, my, into the sinful areas of my life. This isn't to discourage you, but it's just a warning, isn't it, that even our own hearts can be divided. Even our own hearts can have that begrudging view of Jesus. Uh, Christians in Smyrna were not only against a world that wanted to physically harm them, but they were also against uh, a world that wanted their reputation to be dragged down. Uh, Maybe you can identify a little bit like this. I mean, one of our biggest fears here, isn't it, is um, our reputation. Uh, Maybe uh, you don't get invited to things at your workplace because you're a Christian. Maybe you're overlooked for promotion or made fun of at work or school. Uh, There are going to be various people in the future who look to do harm to Christians in various ways. But the encouragement to Smyrna was to not be afraid, to cling to the one who is victorious. We need to look, don't we, at some of the things that we're going to, um, the, the Christians in Smyrna were going to face. Spiritual forces were against them, and they were going to drive them to imprisonment and to the point of death. Um, now, the, the, you might have mentioned, uh, noticed another thing that the passage mentions there, the 10 days. Now, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of the 10 days. There's a, a few theological views but what mostly I think this is referring to is a limited period of time of suffering and one commentator put it like this although the church might face the death of the body it will not face the death of the soul the church will face persecution for 10 days but on the 11th day there will be victory the suffering would be limited but the victory would be eternal The letter God wrote to this church uh, became reality. Um, This is one of the stories um, of one of the leaders in Smyrna. You may have heard of him. Really interesting story, a guy called Polycarp. Now, Polycarp, he died uh, a pretty brutal death, and I won't go into it because I know that there's kids in the service, but he was a really influential Christian leader at Smyrna, and he got killed, I think, around uh, 60 years after the letter. But before he died, he said something really interesting. Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and saviour? You threaten me with fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire that is everlasting punishment. I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. Where did Polycarp get his motivation to be faithful, even when he was facing death? Why would he obey? It's because Polycarp had the view that the body could be killed, but the soul could not. When we uh, look to the one, we look to the one, don't we, that wasn't driven to the point of death, we look to the one who went through death. We look to the one who went to the cross before they got the crown. Uh, This is what Philippians 2 says, um, who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest praise and gave him the name that is above every name. That at 
the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Where do we go when we lack the courage to endure? Well, we go to him, don't we? Where do we go when we're mocked for believing in Jesus? We go to him. And in the future, if this church faces persecution or discrimination or imprisonment or maybe even death, we will go to him, won't we? Then comes, in verse 11, the ultimate encouragement because the story isn't over. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not at all be hurt by the second death. Um, I think I've shared this story before in probably some of my other sermons, but um, this is the story of Horatio Spafford. Um, He wrote a song that we sometimes sing in church uh, called It Is Well. And the backstory to this song was some tragic events in Spafford's life. Uh, The first was the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which left him financially ruined because he'd invested a lot in property in Chicago. Um, His other business interests were hit uh, in an economic downturn of 1873, and he planned to travel uh, to England to help um, a minister with evangelistic events. So he was a a Christian, and his plan was to go to England and be an evangelist. But in a late change of plan, rather than the whole family travelling together, he sent his wife, Anna, and four daughters ahead of him uh, because he was delayed um, with his business interests in Chicago. Uh, While crossing the ocean, um, the ship sank uh, with a collision in another vessel, and all of Spafford's daughters... Uh, passed away. His wife survived and sent a telegram that said, saved alone. Um, Shortly afterwards, as Spafford travelled to England to meet his grieving wife, uh, he was inspired to write these words. As as the ship passed the spot near where his daughters passed away, though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, lest this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. What did Spafford do when he faced those trials that were unimaginable? He went, didn't he, to the one who could get him, get him through it. He remembered, didn't he, the fact that Jesus shed his own blood for his soul. Our church may face persecution, but we will not be hurt by that second death, if we trust in Jesus. Um, As I finish, uh, I want to try and apply this to us. And I think maybe we can uh, gloss over, can't we, the start of verse 11. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Um, Now, I like to think that ears in my family are quite a strong point, as you'll notice. And I've inflicted at least two of my sons with the same type of ears, okay? It's unlucky they'll have to deal with it, one of the trials, okay? Um, The Bible says that listening is really important. And uh, I know the kids are are in today, so um, I want to say, kids and young people, uh, you're going to have so many voices that are thrown at you, particularly in the days of, um, you know, social media. Um, We live, don't we, in a world of distraction, But I want to say to you that the word of God is the most important thing. You need to keep listening to that. That will stand you um, in good stead to carry on with Jesus, regularly reading his word, shutting off the noise. And uh, let me speak as well to those who perhaps aren't believers here today. I wonder what you're banking on. Um, We don't like to talk, do we, about death. And, uh, you know, I don't want to score any points with this, but this week shows us, doesn't it, um, how fragile life can be. I want to ask you, what is running your life at the moment? What voices are running life? Uh, The Bible is clear, isn't it, that one day everyone will pass on 
to eternity. And I want to ask you, have you got the ears to listen? Does the gospel strike a chord with you this morning? Because there's a God, uh, many people tell you in this church, there's a God who not only saves us from eternal death, but he reshapes our life. Uh, He puts things in perspective. And maybe an application to us all, uh, whether we're a believer or not a believer, we need to, to understand, don't we, what runs our week, what voices run our week, what situations um, are stopping us from hearing the word of God. We want to be people, don't we, that have ears that hear, not in just the, the, the bad times when we need God, but the good times as well. We want to be a church, don't we, that has ears to hear what God is saying to us. So uh, I want to pray uh, in a minute that we would be a hearing church, a church that wants to hear God's word, uh, a church that stands up uh, for the gospel uh, now when things are potentially relatively calm, but also a church that may have to face persecution in the future. I want to pray that we're a church that lives out that cross before we get that glorious crown from Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that that is truth. We thank you for Christ who uh, chose the cross before the crown. And we want to pray, Lord, that we would be uh, mini Jesus as Lord. Please would we be people um, who live out the gospel here And we want to pray that um, we wouldn't face persecution or discrimination, Lord, but we know that that is a real reality in the future. And so we want to pray that through your strength, uh, we would stand up and be counted. Would we not rely on ourselves to get us through that, but rather we look to you. And we want to praise you and thank you for that eternal future that we have with you. In your name, amen. Great. Um, I think the plan is to sing.